You may have a seat. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Hosea. Just flip right there, book of Hosea. So uh, some of you are wondering, how do you find Hosea? So if you're familiar with the Bible, it's the book right after the book of Daniel. Uh, for me, the easiest way to find Hosea is to open to probably the third page of your Bible to the book of Contents. Scan down till you find the book of Hosea. It'll give you a page number and just turn there. So the book of Hosea this morning, I want to talk about a moral uh, perfection, moral perfection. There was a lady had a kidney stone, uh, which uh, she painfully passed. Some of you who had kidney stones can relate to that. A little while later, you know, six months later, her husband had a kidney stone, which he actually passed also. Um, but she took it as an opportunity to say to him, let uh, the one who cast the first stone be without sin. Let the one who's without sin cast the first stone. So uh, she, in essence, was claiming uh, to be morally perfect. Thank you very much for my inability to tell a joke. <laughs> so um, uh, Benjamin Franklin also uh, pursued uh, moral perfection. Like, he was a very interesting guy. In his autobiography, he writes about his desire to be morally perfect. He said, I convinced the bold and, or I conceived the bold and arduous product, project of arriving at moral perfection. I wish to live without committing any fault at all. I would conquer all that either natural or inclinations, customs, or company might lead me into. As I knew or thought I knew, what was right or wrong. I didn't see why I might not always do one or the other. Why couldn't I always do right or wrong? But I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I had imagined. While my care was employed in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another fault. Habit took the advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. I concluded at length that the mere speculative convic conviction that it was our interest to be completely virtuous was not sufficient to prevent our slipping. In other words, if the desire is there, that's not going to be sufficient to keep you morally pure. You're going to slip into moral, moral impurity. All of us have sinned. All of us are morally impure except one, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus committed no sin. Where does the Bible teach that? And why is that important? That really is the question that Matthew is answering in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. You don't need to turn there. I'll have it for you on the screen. But Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. You'll remember the Magi have come and seen Jesus. At this point in the story, uh, they've left their returning back to their home. It was with that that an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to do three things. After getting up, he was take, to take the child and his mother. He was to go or escape to Egypt, and he was to stay there until he got further instructions. And the reason he needed to do that was Herod was insane. He was consumed with jealousy paranoid that somebody else was going to try and take his kingdom. He was afraid that Jesus, born king of the Jews, was going to attempt to do that. So he desired to put Jesus to death. Joseph does exactly as the angel tells him to do. He gets uh, uh, Jesus and Mary, and he begins this at least 100-mile journey, 13 days to Egypt. After they got up, he took the child and his mother he left or escaped for Egypt, and he stayed there until the death of Herod. It makes perfect sense. And then Matthew has this conclusion, which throws people. He says, all this happened to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. All this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. Out of Egypt, I called my son. And you think, yeah, there must be more to it than that, a little confused. You desire to flip back to where the Old Testament said that, so you look at your cross-references. You see he's quoting Hosea 11 and verse 1. And so you flip back there, and you read about a problem. The problem is, on one hand, Hosea is not talking about a person. 
he's talking about a people. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The son in context is not a person, it is a people. It's Israel. Be- beyond that, uh, Hosea is not talking about prophecy, he's talking about history. There was a time in Israel's history when they were in bondage, enslaved in Egypt. God had compassion on his people and he delivered them from Egypt. So when he says, out of Egypt I called my son, he's not talking about prophecy, he's talking about history. But for some reason, Matthew kind of sees what happened with Jesus. I mean, he fled a tyrannical leader to Egypt, came out of Egypt after that leader died, and boom, somehow he takes that line as this word of prophecy that out of Egypt, I called my son. Like what in the world is going on with that? You're not the only one that wonders what Matthew is up to. I mean, it almost sounds like he's grasping at straws. A number of people have noticed that. A number of scholars have noticed that. Uh, One of the uh, New Testament profs at um, the bastion of evangelical Christianity, um, uh, TCU, (laughs) uh, accused Matthew of manipulating the evidence in a way that would be unconvincing to outsiders. I mean, he's just grabbing some kind of Old Testament scripture and applying it to Jesus. But really what he's doing is he's manipulating the evidence. But the prophet TCU is not the only one saying that. Uh, One commentator that I really like says it like this. He thinks that Matthew, in his eagerness to convince the Jews that Jesus was the promised anointed one of God, he finds prophecies in the Old Testament where no prophecy was ever meant. I mean, it's history. It almost seems like Matthew is just kind of arbitrarily changing what is history into prophecy. But that position for me, gives me consternation because of the way that Matthew writes it. Notice he says, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Matthew is saying, I'm not grabbing at straws. I'm not just arbitrarily applying Old Testament. This fulfills the Old Testament passage. But if Barclay is right and if boring, how would you like to be a prof with your last name is boring? Um, If those guys are right, then what Matthew says here cannot be trusted. I mean, Jesus wasn't fulfilling this prophecy. And if Jesus is not fulfilling this prophecy like Matthew says he is, then how can you trust anything that Matthew says? Well, as I've kind of considered these things, um, I've come to conclude that I like better what a uh, commentator named France wrote. He, he thinks Matthew is doing something different in this passage. He thinks Matthew is deliberately composing a chapter rich in potential exegetical bonuses. Do you like that? Um, <laughs> so that the more fully a reader understood the Old Testament context, the more the reader was likely to, der- to derive um, meaning from his reading. What France is saying is that the problem is not with Matthew. The problem is with us. The problem is that we don't really understand our Old Testaments. Like we read the Old Testament superficially and we import our superficial interpretation of the Old Testament into what Matthew says and accuse Matthew of being superficial. What France says, if you really understood the Old Testament, then you would see the beauty an incredible meaning behind what Matthew wrote when he quoted Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt, I called my son. So let me show you what I think Matthew is saying when he quotes Hosea as saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. To understand what Matthew is saying, I think you've got to first understand what the word fulfilled means. So when we read the word fulfilled, so the word was fulfilled, what we think is it's something that was predicted and came true. Much like earlier in Matthew chapter two, when Matthew said, so was fulfilled, 
um, you know, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Therefore, this prediction about the Messiah now has come true. But what we neglect is that there is a second meaning of the word fulfilled. Sometimes the word refers to what was predicted that now came true. On the other hand, sometimes it refers to something that is pictured in the past and is fully realized in the present. Sometimes it's a real event that happened in the past that is fully pictures something that is fully realized in the present. This is the way James uses the word fulfilled in James chapter 2 and verse 23. So he quotes this Old Testament passage about um, Abraham. Abraham. It's uh, Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In that moment, that was true of Abraham. But that statement pictured something fuller that would be realized in the future. And that's faith in Jesus Christ. You know, by faith now, through Christ, we believe God. And because of that faith in Christ, that uh, faith is counted as righteousness. So it's not like this prediction that was made in Genesis that, was, um, that came true in James. It's this picture that meant something in real time that reaches its full realization in the future. So the word fulfilled pictures. Some, it can mean prediction. It can mean picture. I think in this context, when Matthew uses the word fulfill, he's talking about it pictures something. So out of Egypt, I called my son, pictured something. I think it's also helpful to realize that the timing of the word fulfilled can be different. The, the grammar that Matthew uses can refer to something that has come to completion. So it's fulfilled, it's done. You know, um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so that prophecy, it's done. So sometimes it could be completion. Sometimes the fulfillment can describe something that is initiated and eventually will reach its full fulfillment, which is what I think Matthew is doing here. I think when he says, out of Egypt, I called my son, he's describing a picture of something that has been initiated and will be fully realized in the future. I know that's probably confusing, but let me apply that to the passage in Hosea chapter 11. So how does that fit in Hosea 11? I'm hoping you're there. So Hosea 11 begins with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is in captivity in Egypt under this tyrannical leader, Pharaoh. Hosea is describing that day and he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. God loved Israel. And out of his love for Israel, Hosea says, out of Egypt, I called my son. So pay attention to that. Out of Egypt, I called my son. They were in bondage, so God calls them out of Egypt. He not only calls them away from something, he calls them to something, which the context will indicate. He calls them away from something and he calls them to something. He calls them away from bondage to live a life in a way that magnifies the greatness of God. So Israel was called away from bondage to live a life, live in a way that magnifies the greatness of God. The problem was they did not obey their calling. They were called out of Egypt from to but they didn't obey their calling. He goes on, verse two, he says, but the more they were called, the more they went away from me. And you remember the story, Israel got involved in gross idolatry and sin. Consequently, they fell under the judgment of God. And in verse five, he says, as a result, will they not return to Egypt? Egypt is this metaphor for Assyria. Will not Assyria rule over them because they refused to repent. You'll remember that Israel, because of their sin, fell under the judgment of God. So God brought in the Assyrians that carried the nation of Israel off into captivity. That's history. But when Matthew reads this, he sees Jesus. He evidently notices something in verse one. Out of Egypt, I called my son. In Hebrew, that word son is singular. So it, it could be this um, collective singular 
that refers to the nation of Israel, which is the way people typically read that. But Matthew began to think, I wonder, could it, the singular not be a collective singular, but as a singular, could it refer to a person? Could it refer to Jesus Christ? So the verse begins, when Israel was a child, I loved him. John 3, 35 says, the father loves the son and has given everything into his hands. Jesus was loved by the father. So in out of Egypt, I called my son. Just like Israel was called away from to a life yielded over to the magnification of, G, of, of God to show how great and grand and glorious God was. So Jesus, because of his love by the Father, was called by the Father to live his life for the glory of God. But now different from Israel, who did not fulfill their calling, Jesus fulfilled that calling. He is the true one who has been called out of Egypt to give glory to God. So what Matthew is saying here is this is not a prediction that Jesus fulfilled completely in time. Instead, this is a prophecy in terms of picture. It pictures something, something that Israel did not complete but that now Jesus Christ has completed. He is the true son who has been called out of Israel. He came out of Israel and he, or he came out of Egypt and he stayed out of Egypt. He is the perfect son of God. So what does that mean? When, when Matthew writes, um, this happened to fulfill what the prophet, the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. He means that Jesus fulfills what Israel could not do. What does that mean for us? It guarantees you and I of the possibility of eternity. So when the a rabbi quoted a passage, he assumed that his audience was familiar not just with that passage, but with the entire context of that passage. So a rabbi may say, for God so loved the world. And he knew his audience would understand the remainder of that passage and its whole context. They were, Jews were incredibly familiar with the Old Testament. So when Matthew uses this passage, he assumes that you know the whole context of Hosea chapter 11. Watch where chapter 11 goes. So they're sold into captivity under the nation of the hand of Assyria, that because of their sin. But God says, I'm not going to leave you there. Verse 8 in chapter 11, he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I'll not carry out my fear my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. In other words, their captivity is not absolute. There's a future for Israel. What is that future? Verse 11, they will come from Egypt. There it is again. Trembling like sparrows from Assyria, fluttering like doves, and I will settle them in their homes. There is a future kingdom coming. A future kingdom where the son of God will rule on the earth and Israel will have a place in that kingdom. But you've just read chapter 11 and you scratch your head and wonder, how can that be? How can Israel have a place in God's future kingdom? I mean, before, here they are. They were called, but they sinned and consequently they came under his judgment. Sure enough, they'll be called again in the future but Israel's MO is they'll go right back into sin. So how will they not fall under judgment again in the future, keeping them from uh, remaining in God's kingdom? And the answer is the one who was called out of Egypt. Like Israel suffered, so Jesus suffered. But while Israel suffered for their sin, Jesus did not suffer for his sin. He was perfect. Instead, Jesus suffered for my sin and for your sin and for Israel's sin and the sin of the whole world. And because Jesus suffered for sin, he makes possible 
relationship with God. When a person believes in Christ, his sacrifice on the cross is credited to their account. First Peter says he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross. When we believe in him, um, his death and sacrifice, payment for sin on the cross is credited to our account. Consequently, we are forgiven, reconciled with God, which means that home in this future kingdom is not based on my behavior. Home in the future is based on my belief. If I, if you, if Israel believes in Christ, then judgment is not absolute. It's temporary, and eternity will be spent uh, with the Lord. That's what Matthew is trying to say when he says, out of Egypt I called my son. To summarize, I think what Matthew is trying to say is God called Israel away from Egypt, out of Egypt, to live for his glory, a calling they did not fulfill. And like Israel... The father called the son away out of Egypt to live for his glory. Yet different from Israel, Jesus fulfilled his calling and in fulfilling his calling made eternity with God possible for you and me. So what does God want us to say, want to say to us through a passage like this? Let me just give you three applications and I'll be done. The first is um, there is a beauty to scripture that skeptics never see. I wish I had stated that point instead of negatively. I wish I had stated it positively. I wish I had said there's a beauty to Scripture that seekers can find. So by skeptics, I don't mean people who are trying to find truth. I mean people who have a disposition or a predisposition that says, you know, the Bible is um, not truth, Uh, It's full of errors. Um, It's just ancient writings and it's meaningless and I'm gonna read it and prove to you that it is. And so they come to Matthew chapter two and verse 15 and they see out of Egypt, I call my son and you know, Matthew's just proof texting. It's just a foolish quote. You know, that's what a skeptic would say. Those, a person who is skeptical like that, um, they'll never see the beauty of scripture, but there's so much beauty in scripture. Matthew 2, verse 15 is an example of that. I mean, these guys, they knew their Bible. And when Matthew quotes that verse, it is full of meaning. And if you are a seeker who seriously considers the word of God, you set yourself up to find incredible beauty that's in those pages. There's a beauty to scripture that seekers can find. A second thing is there's a way to God that Jesus made possible. I mean, because we were morally imperfect, we were doomed to eternal separation from a holy God. I mean, relationship with God was impossible, but Jesus made a way possible. He made that way possible by being the son that came out of Egypt. He came out of Egypt, stayed out of Egypt. He remained sinless and then died in our place on the cross, paid for sin. He was the only one qualified to die to pay for sin. God is holy, which means he can't be satisfied by anything that is less than himself because Jesus was God veiled in human flesh and because Jesus was perfect, he's the only one qualified to pay for our sin. And because he paid for it, he made possible relationship with God. And then a third thing, I think the passage says is there's a payment for sin that must be received. There's a way to God that's now made possible through Christ, but that way only becomes yours when you personally receive Christ uh, as your Savior. It's the one who forgives your sin. The, The Bible says not as many as knew him, but as many as received Christ to those who gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. Let me tell you what that means. So growing up, I had heard the gospel. Um, I knew that Jesus died. I knew that he died to pay for sin, but I was still separated from God because Christ was not my savior. But then things changed on April 17th, 1978. On April 17th, 1978, I heard the gospel 
I heard that Jesus died, that he paid for sin, and that if you will receive Christ as your Savior, that payment will be yours. And on April 17, 1978, I received Christ as my Savior. And on that day, everything changed. I was reconciled with God. I was in, inherited abundant life, um, eternity, my et total eternal trajectory changed. Everything changed when I received Christ. Jesus has made a way to God possible. But that way becomes yours when you personally receive what Christ did for you on the cross. I, I want to conclude just by quickly telling you what I think Matthew is up to in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, this is a picture of the North Pole. So, some of you are thinking, of course, because that's where Santa Claus lives. In fact, Matthew Bell, when I showed this picture, he was trying to figure out where Santa's house is on the North Pole. So but that's the North Pole. It's called True North. And the North Pole, True North is important, um, particularly in a society that didn't have Google Maps or ways or maps at all. There was a day that to get from point A to point B and from point B back to point A, you had to find a consistent point to look to so you get directions. That was true north. If you knew true north, if you knew where the North Pole is, you could get anywhere uh, there and back. Uh, the problem is from Texas, it's hard to see the North Pole. Um, so God has done something that uh, is extremely helpful. He hung a star in the sky called the North Star. Um, the North Star always points to true north. If you find the North Star, then you know what true north is. But even that has a problem. And that's the North Star is not the only star in the heavens. <laughs> and not only that, it's not the brightest star in the heavens. So how do you find the North Star? God has also put in place the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper moves. But if you find the Big Dipper and uh, you find the front of the Big Dipper, determine, you know, the top so where the water pours out, the distance from the bottom to the top of the front of the Big Dipper, if you multiply that times five, draw a straight line times five, you will always be at the North Star, and you can always find your way to true north. I'll tell you that because it's, what's true in astronomy is also true spiritually. So we need a true north. Like where do we find meaning and purpose in life? It's found in relationship with the true God. God is the one who prescribes what is necessary for human flourishing. It's in relationship with him that we find the life that we long for, but we can't see God. How do we find our way to God? God has given us a North Star, and it's Jesus Christ. You find Jesus, and you find your way to the true God. But how do you find your way to Jesus? What Matthew is saying in Matthew chapter one and chapter two is that the prophecies in the Bible are like the Big Dipper. If you pay attention to the prophecies, those prophecies, whether they're pictures or predictions, they will point you to Jesus. And it's through Jesus that you'll find the life that you have always longed for. The question is, what child is this? Matthew says, this child is the fulfillment of Israel. He, this child is the perfect one through whom you can find eternal life. This is the child who came out of Egypt. Would you pray with me?